In a world of globalization, economic uncertainty, terrorism, culture clash, family disintegration, corporate distrust, youth disillusionment, political confusion, and religious corruption, the wisdom to navigate successfully through life is necessary. Welcome to Living Effectively. Living Effectively, a program designed to provide wisdom, insight, information, and inspiration to effectively face the challenges of the 21st century world. Today, I want to focus on our theme for 2010. And please write this down. I want to deal this morning with what is law? What is law? When we use the word law, what do we mean? It is not a simple concept especially from the point of view of those of us who were brought up in religion and as specifically those who were brought up in evangelical Protestant religion, it's very, very difficult to understand the word. As a matter of fact, I was born in the Bahamas. I was born in a re religious family. My father who is still with us today. I was born with him being a minister. He used to be a minister in the Brethren Church when I was first born. And uh, we moved over from the Brethren to the Baptists. And he was a Baptist minister as well for most of our lives. And then my mother moved from the Baptist Church and she went to the Pentecostal Church. And so I had both the Baptist, I was Baptistocostal. And uh, she would take us to the Pentecostal church. And then he would take us to the Baptist church. And, and so I was Bapticostalized. But we went through all of that experience. And one of the things they never talked about, never talked about, in any of those churches was law. Law. And yet the Bible is a book of law. They kept talking about grace and grace and grace and freedom and grace. And, and this, is, this is in order, I assume. But I believe that we have been robbed in a very real sense of the beauty of the balance of law and grace. I think the result of our experience was that we ended up hating law. We were taught to love grace and hate law. I believe I understand what they attempted to do. Because, you know, all of us uh, have been in some way perhaps touched by the power of the oppressiveness of legalism. So I want to talk about that today. Get a copy of this series, this particular session, please, and listen to it. I'm going to say some things you didn't hear and you wouldn't hear until you hear it the third time. What is law? When we use the term law, what are we talking about? We want to understand what I call the principle of law. What is the real nature of law when we use the term? And I need to do some definitions today to make sure you are not confused and that also that you are able to share with people intelligently what we are trying to understand here today. I want to begin with a simple statement. Why keep the law? Write that down. Why keep the law? There are religious people who will say to you, who attend this church, is your pastor teaching on law? 
Is he going back into law? Is he going back into bondage? But when the Lord first spoke to me about this theme, I had the same questions for him. I said, Lord, you are wanting to take me back to law? And of course, he had to clean me out a little bit and correct me. And he did. He corrected me. So I want to ask some questions to clarify your mind. Here's the first question. Do we pay taxes and customs duties to become citizens? What's the answer? Are you sure? Okay, I want you to, this is important. Do we pay taxes to become citizens of a country? Do you pay taxes so you could become a citizen of a country? It's an important question. Taxes, taxation is a law. Paying duties on products that you bring in is a law. So, do you, do you keep that law to become a citizen? That's the question. The answer is obviously no. Second question. Do we stop at a red light to become a citizen of a country? No. So you obey the sign of the red light. You obey that law. The law which says every time the red light comes on, you must stop your vehicle. Now that's a law. It's against the law to drive through a red light. So every time you stop at a red light, you are obeying a law. The question is, is stopping at the red light required to become a citizen? The answer is what? No. Third question, do we not steal to become citizens? No. Do we not murder people to become citizens? In other words, as long as I don't kill people, I'm a citizen. No. Now, it's against the law to take someone's life. It's against the law to remove people's property without permission. That's the law. But do we do those things in order to become citizens of the country? The answer is no. But yet we keep the laws. Third question, do we keep law to become a citizen? That's the bottom line. Do we keep law to become citizens? What's the answer? No. Okay, so then we, we settle that issue. You don't use law to become a citizen of a country. You don't keep laws to become a citizen of a country. So law doesn't make you a citizen. Of a country. In other words, abiding by the laws doesn't make you a citizen. This is very important. Because I think this is where the argument is with the subject of law. So, do we keep law to become citizens? Absolutely no. But write this down. We keep law because we are already citizens. And that's what's missing in the kingdom of God's community. When you become a citizen, then the law becomes a requirement. You don't keep law to become a citizen. You keep the law because you are a citizen. What does that mean? It means this. Law is not rituals. When you stop at a red light, that's not a ritual, is it? No. <laughs> that's a law. I want in this session, hopefully for the rest of your life, to clarify the difference between a ritual, law, and a divine law. They're different. And what, what we battle with in the body of Christ is confusing ritual law 
with divine law. Can I put it this way? We are afraid of law because we've been taught that law is bondage. Well, stopping at a red light, is that bondage? Hello? Is it bondage? No, it's what? Protection. You keep law to protect your life. Sometimes you're in a hurry and you don't want to stop, but you stop. Why? You'd rather get where you're going than to go to heaven quickly. <laughs> So even though you may be desirous of breaking that law, because the law is there to protect you, you submit to it. Now, make a note of this. The subject of law is a source of fear for most people. It brings them discomfort, especially when you talk to a Protestant Christian. We don't worship law. We obey law. Law is there to serve us. We are not there to serve the law. The subject of law is also a source of contradiction for many people. They say, well, you know, I'm saved by grace, so I'm not under law anymore. Well, they quote that from the Bible without understanding, first of all, who the author was, where he came from, what his history was, and what he was dealing with 2,000 years ago in his community with religious people. And this is one of the problems, I believe, that we have cultivated in this contemporary church since we've moved away from understanding the root of the concept of law to the point where we are Afraid to even think of being under law. That leads me to point number three. The subject of law is a source of paranoia. People get paranoid. Uh, do you mean that we have to go and kill lambs again? Do we need to go and offer blood again? They are not divine laws. Offering a lamb on an altar was a ritual law not a divine law. I'm not paranoid. Can I put it this way? My success in my life is because I keep the law of God. The only way to prove you are a citizen of a country is to keep the law. You don't keep the law to become a citizen. You keep the law to prove that you are a citizen of the country. In our session last year, uh, God took us through something that I had to kind of pull back on. Well, you didn't even know that, but you know, we talk about kingdom community. You cannot build a kingdom community unless the people agree to obey the same laws. Because community is a product of laws. So God says, back up and go back to law first. What makes the Bahamas or Jamaica or America a country is law. That's why the first thing you establish to start a country is a constitution. A constitution is a contract that the people make with themselves to keep certain laws and ideals. That's what makes the country. Now, if you disobey those agreed laws, then you are no longer worthy of being in the community. What do they do? They take you out of the community and put you in another community. It's called prison. And if you rehabilitate, that means you agree to keep the laws again, then they might put you back in the bigger community again. Okay, you can keep the law. So we are paranoid because we've been taught that law is bad. When in fact, law is the best thing that ever happened to us. As a matter of fact, all the bad things that have been happening to you is because you violated law. For example, just the law of good, healthy eating. 
Your arteries are clogged up. That ain't no demon. That's fat. Where did it come from? It ain't come from the devil. That's the poke chop for 20 years, man. And you violated the law of the body. Am I coming through? And then we ask God to heal us. And after he gets, we get healed, we go straight back to dirties. It's, you know, praise the Lord. I'm going to celebrate at dirties. Dirties, please forgive me. But, you know, we, we think that law is bad. Well, it depends. Uh, write this down. The subject of law is a paradox. People say, well, I am either under law or under grace. Well, it depends on what they mean by law, which we'll hopefully deal with before we leave. Because when you use the word law again, stop using it loosely. Because there are two types of laws. As a matter of fact, yay, even three. So when you use the word law, you got to be careful because there are three different types of laws that we're supposed to live by. And one of them is not permanent, which we'll hopefully talk about in this session. Now, why do people fear the law? And this is the big word. Write this word down. They say they are afraid of legalism. Everybody say legalism. Now, there are a lot of lawyers in here today. I've seen some already. And the lawyers will tell you that this word legalism is not a bad word. But religious people, those who claim to be saved by grace, hate this word. They've actually been taught that this word is demonic. Legalism. They associate legalism with cult, bondage, oppression, control. Well, I am sure perhaps in some cases they've experienced or seen others experience certain things that would have that kind of connotation. But this word legalism is not what you think it is. What is legalism? I thought I would, would try and clear that up in your mind. First of all, I want to make it clear. Civil law is not rituals. Write that down. Everybody say civil. Say it again, civil. Now, where does the word civil come from? Civic. Civic. Where does civic come from? It comes from citizen. Civilized. People living together together. Civilized in order. Civilized means we are creatures of law. When you are uncivilized, what we usually suggest it mean is that you are wild. You have no control, no self-control, and no boundaries. You you wild. You say, girls stop acting uncivilized. What we mean is you acting out of control. Well, what controls you? Law. So when the Bahamas government or Jamaican government or Canadian government or U.S. government used the word civilian law, which all countries use, what they mean is we have set laws so we can all be civil. Law does bring control, but it's control for your benefit. Grace has become a license for uncivilized behavior. But I'm going to sin now because God will forgive me tonight when I pray. See, so we use grace, that's the forgiveness piece, so we can sin. We don't want no boundaries against sin. Leave me alone, let me repent after I'm finished. And God is saying, no. You are civil. You are in my country. You're in my kingdom. You can't live like this. There's boundaries in my country. Civil law is not rituals. Let me explain what I mean by that. Law is designed to bring order. So here's what I am always going to keep repeating until I die. God designed 
everything in life to function by laws. Why? Laws keep order. Law is the most beautiful thing I've discovered. I'm not talking about rituals. I'm talking about laws that give life and protect life. Like the law of gravity. What a beautiful law. Gravity allows you to stand up without falling down. Gravity allows this building to remain attached to the earth. Gravity is a powerful law, but we got to obey it. You can try to disobey gravity very easily. Go on top of this building and jump. You tell gravity, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Jesus Christ has said, gravity, do your work, baby. Boom, you're dead. Because it's a law. You, even if you try to resist it, it works. And gravity is a blessing. Fire is the law of combustion. Fire is a law. You cook with fire. But the fire can also burn your house down if you play with matches. So laws are there to cook for you or cook you. It depends on how you use the law. Everybody with me? Yes. You can have sex, that's a law. You can have sex inside marriage, outside marriage. You can have it any way you want. One will cook for you, other will cook you. It's that simple. Your guilt will be with you forever. God made everything to function by law. And wherever there is disorder, you can guarantee that there is an absence of law or a violation of law. Every accident in the Bahamas, you see every car, you see having an accident, maybe you see cars piled up somewhere. Somebody break the law. Wherever there's disorder, somebody violated law. You run the red light and now three people are dead. One person break the law, three are dead. That's disorder. Write this down. Disorder always precedes destruction. You want your life to fall apart? No problem. It's very simple. Just violate the laws of life. I'm not talking about ritual religious law. I'm talking about just the, the simple laws of life. I put it again that the key to order is law. When you obey law, you automatically organize your own life. My life is orderly because of law. Uh, you know, when the Bible used to term the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, the verse before that says, the law of the Lord is wise. If you fear the law of God, you have wisdom. What makes me look like I'm smart is I simply learn laws. People think I'm smart. The Bible says, if a young man learns the laws of God, he will become wiser than his own teachers. How can you become smarter than your teachers? Learn the laws the teachers don't know. The power of law. Uh, make a note of this. The key to success in life then is submission to law. You don't need to wonder whether you will fail or succeed. And I know, listen, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me carefully. I know sometimes your patience runs out, you know. You become impatient because, you know, you're waiting for things to happen in your life. And you say, God, why is it taking so long? Do you know something? When you obey the laws of God, they begin to work. But it takes a while sometimes for them to manifest. You stay faithful, man. You can get that house. When you plant a seed in the ground, does it grow in the morning? But guess what? It's working. And you can't see it for weeks, but it's working. Sometimes for months it's buried. It's working. And one day you see this little thing pushing through the soil. And you think it just began to grow. When you obey God, things start working immediately. You know, when September comes, some of y'all are going to see the shoot. By December, ain't nobody going to know you're the same person. Why? Some stuff that you are obeying God in now will come up in November. 
All you got to do is to make sure I'm obeying the laws of God. That's all. You obey them and they work. And they don't work when you want them to work. They work by the cause of God's great plan. Like that seed. You submit to laws, you succeed. Disobedience to law produces disorder. Hmm. Life is too simple for me to be complicated. If you are having financial challenges, just kind of search your life a little bit and see if there's any area where you might be violating some basic laws like, you know, abusing the money or saving properly or spending on things perhaps that you couldn't afford at the time. I mean, just check. There may be some things that you need to just look at. And, um, you know, you don't got to bind the devil all the time. You pray for God to heal you. God says, okay, no problem. Stop eating quawa duff. And you're like, I bind you in the name of Jesus. She said, I am Jesus. Stop eating quawa duff. <laughs> in other words, we want God to tell us what to do, but don't do what we want to do. Don't touch what we want to do. We, you know, and believe me now, I like guava duff. But that sauce is 99% sugar. 100%. 100% sugar. And then when you add the butter to it, Lord, I better stop talking about this. I see the guilt all over your face already. Hmm? And they say white sugar turns into carbohydrate, which is stored in the cells as fat, which then accumulate in your arteries, and enough duff will duff you. <laughs> but, you know, we say, God, please don't touch my duff. It's the law. So we, we disobey the law, and then our body is in disorder. The Bible says, husband, love your wives. That's a law. It's a law. Love your wife. It never tells the wife to love the husband. Husband, love your wife. Now, love is a verb. It's an action word. Thank you for joining us today on Living Effectively. For copies of this program, the complete teaching series, books, CDs, DVDs, magazines, and other resource materials by Dr. Miles Monroe, or information on seminars, conferences, workshops, and itinerary travels to your area, visit our website at milesmonroeinternational.com or bfmmm.com. Email us at info at mmi.com. And remember, our mission is to help you live effectively.